In my work, I synthesize insights from every school of psychology. I am not an adherent of any specific school or, or system. I borrow from everyone. I'm eclectic. As I believe everyone throughout the history of psychology, now almost 200 years, everyone involved has had pertinent insights. Of course, some of them more than others, and some of them were on the fringe, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. The psychoanalytic movement has had its share of charlatans, con artists, and nut jobs, and among the upper levels, upper layers. And outstanding among these was Sigmund Freud, who was a narcissist, a bit of a con artist, and a lot of a charlatan. He was also an unmitigated genius who provided, a, provided us with dozens of amazing insights into the human mind. Same applies to Jung, who was a nut job, <laughs> a wacko if I ever came across one, and yet was able to provide nuggets of truth and insight. So we should never ever discard the baby with the bath water, with the bath, with the bathroom and with the apartment, as many have been doing in psychology departments throughout the world. Freud was fully cognizant of the shared fantasy, although he never used the phrase, Sander did in 1989. But Freud's relationship with Martha Bernays, his fiancée and later long-suffering wife, his relationship with her was the first thoroughly documented case of a shared fantasy. Almost 1,600 letters have survived in which the intricate back and forth, idealization, devaluation, coercion, and subtlety were documented to the minutest details. So the first shared fantasy also belonged to the father of the psychoanalytic movement. In 1933, Freud has written, even a marriage is not made secure until the wife has succeeded in making her husband her child and in acting as a mother to her husband. <laughs> That's a very juvenile, infantile even, adolescent perception of the relationship between men and women. It's also conservative because this was the end of the 19th century and that part is understandable. But to cast your loved one as a mother, that's utterly immature. Freud wrote to his fiancée that their ideal happiness couldn't last for long because dangerous rivals soon appear. And who are these rivals? Other men, maybe? No way. According to Freud, the, rival, the rivals to the good relationship between a husband and a wife are, and I'm quoting, household chores and, nurse, and nursery. In other words, the appearance of children. The husband should have the unmitigated and undivided attention of his wife. And when this attention is doled out, when this attention is redirected at household chores, and even much worse, at newcomers into the family, new children, newborns, then the husband feels deprived of his new mother. That is Freud. <laughs> um, he wrote to his fiancée from the outset that she would be expected to serve his needs, manage his domestic existence, and honor his decisions in all other matters. So in his, in his letters to his fiancée, there are five volumes of them, by the way. Three have been published, another two are to be published, or another one, I think four have been published. Anyhow, in his letters, he diminishes here, he uses diminutives that instrumentalize her and infantilize her. He regresses her time and again in thousands of letters. He addresses her in a way that renders her a servant, a child, typical of the shared fantasy. His message was that his darling girl was to live only for him, 
exercising never individual will. Ernst Jones wrote, Ernst Jones was a biographer of Sigmund Freud and a very, uh, and a great admirer. So his biography is far from objective. But even Ernst Jones wrote that Freud was insisting on nothing less than, and I'm quoting, complete identification, complete identification with himself, his opinions, his feelings, and his intentions. Uh, Martha was not really his unless he could perceive his stamp on her, unless he could brand her or stamp her. And again, the relationship must be quite perfect. The slightest blur was not to be tolerated. At times it seemed as if his goal was fusion rather than union, says Ernst Jones. I think all of you would agree that these are the sentiments and the internal processes of, a, of an arch narcissist, not to say a rank narcissist. And indeed, other unsavory details in Freud's biography provide strong indications that Freud was a malignant narcissist, uh, although albeit not a sadist, but definitely a psychopath and a narcissist. Now, does that mean we should ignore and discard everything he taught us? Of course not. Absolutely not. As I said, the man was a genius and we should wade through his through dozens of his dozens vol of volumes of his writing and thinking we should wade through them because there are perils and diamonds everywhere and we should do the same with all other thinkers in the history of psychology because no one has the monopoly on the truth and no one should be discarded because of who they are perhaps because of what they say, but never because of who they are. That is known as a fallacy called ad hominem. Freud was an unsavory, to a large degree, obnoxious character, in my view. But his contributions would stand forever. And one day, there will be a revival of interest in his work. And at that time, I think it would be incorporated into a new model or a new paradigm of neuroscience. 